Well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, dear participants and audience. Uh, welcome to our second session on Dialogues on uh, Asian Universities. Uh, today, I think we are very privileged and honored uh, to have uh, two very distinguished uh, panel members. And I would just want to briefly uh, highlight uh, the two universities uh, whose uh, former presidents are represented today in this uh, panel. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, from uh, Southern University of Science and Technology, or SASTEC. Uh, this is based in Shenzhen. Chen. Uh, and uh, we have the privilege of having Professor Chen Shiyi, uh, who was the immediate past president of SASTEC, uh, to join us this evening. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, from Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, or just basically Technion in short. Uh, we are very honored again to have Professor Levi Perez, uh, immediate past president of Technion, uh, to join us this evening. Uh, and uh, allow me to introduce myself. I'm In Chai Tan, uh, the current president of the National University of uh, Singapore. Uh, now, the uh, universities that you see in this slide, Sustec, Technion, and uh, NUS, uh, we have given some basic parameters in terms of the number of undergraduates, the number of PhDs and postgraduates, uh, as well as the uh, research funding uh, and also the uh, density of uh, startups uh, in uh, these universities. Right. Uh, now, all the presentation slides uh, would be available to participants uh, and uh, we'll be happy to share the presentations with all of you uh, later on. Uh, and uh, these three universities are in the context of three uh, cities, uh, Shenzhen in China, which is known as uh, China's hub for innovation, or in other words, the Silicon Valley of China. And uh, Shenzhen itself is a big city, uh, has a GDP that uh, of about $420 billion with 70,000 uh, tech companies. Now Haifa in Israel uh, is also known, very well known, as the center for R&D for many multi uh, nationals. And uh, just uh, recently, about a couple of years ago, uh, the Israel Innovation Authority, uh, in collaboration with uh, iLab, which is a consortium uh, of various companies from the industry, uh, has agreed to invest uh, more than 14 million US dollars uh, to ramp up startups uh, in Haifa. And of course, this is in the context of Israel, because all of us know that uh, Israel is a startup nation uh, with one startup per 1,400 people. And uh, it has been extremely successful in startups. Uh, and uh, the third city, uh, this is where I am based, uh, it's Singapore. Uh, we have a population of 5.5 million. Uh, we have a small uh, but quite vibrant startup uh, ecosystem, uh, which was built over the last 20 years, right? And uh, in recent times, I think we are also putting a lot of attention in uh, startups in Singapore. So our topic today is about startup cities and innovation hubs and the role of universities in this innovation hub. Uh, I'll just uh, do some introduction quickly uh, about uh, NUS. Uh, entrepreneurship uh, is one particular aspect that we put a lot of attention. And this is one program which uh, has its roots way back in 2001, when we started the NUS Overseas Colleges, or what is quite well known as 
the NOC program. Uh, and we have NOC programs in about 13 locations across the world, uh, some of which are listed here, Toronto, Stockholm, Silicon Valley, and Shanghai. Uh, and uh, like uh, SASTEC and also Technion, uh, our university has a very comprehensive innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem comprising of entrepreneurial education, uh, co-working facilities, incubation accelerators, lots of events for the community, as well as access to NUS technologies and also access to funding. Right? And these are some of the key ingredients that are needed uh, for an innovation and enterprise ecosystem. Uh, for Singapore, our focus is really in ASEAN. Because if you look at ASEAN, uh, this is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, it comprises 10 countries stretching from Myanmar all the way to Indonesia and Philippines. Uh, and these 10 countries uh, are in this very vibrant region, uh, experiencing rapid economic growth and also an emerging middle class with uh, huge spending power. And it has a population of 650 million uh, with very young and very tech savvy, internet savvy uh, population. And the penetration for internet and for mobile is extremely high, right? Close to 80 to 90%. Uh, there's been an increased interest uh, by venture capitalists, uh, as well as, of course, startup activities. But it is a very complex market uh, because of the different cultures and practices. So uh, how to uh, leverage on the markets and uh, have a common uh, economic region, uh, that's something which uh, ASEAN uh, is working towards. Uh, and just quickly, uh, I've earlier mentioned that for the example of NUS, uh, we have the NOC program. Uh, and this program has been in place for about 20 years. We take in a very small group of students and uh, our statistics show that our NOC alumni are 10 times more likely to become entrepreneurs compared to NUS alumni in general. And I think we are quite happy to note that uh, amongst the startups, especially the active ones, uh, close to 5% comes from uh, active startups that are run by our NOC alumni. Now, this does not include the startups by our professors. This is just manifesting uh, the uh, contributions of graduates from this NOC program. And uh, it is in a way an indication that this program has been extremely useful uh, in the context of NUS and in the context of Singapore in promoting and in uh, building the startup ecosystem. And uh, this is what I would like to share. Uh, between the three universities and the three cities. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Professor Levy Perez uh, to uh, provide his introduction on Technion, Piper, and its many exploits. Uh, Levy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I much appreciate uh, the presentation the invitation to participate in this very, very interesting uh, uh, dialogue uh, about universities and ecosystems. Uh, Israel is known and uh, for good reason. The number of uh, startup companies in Israel is uh, probably per capita the largest in the world. Just to give you uh, some uh, scale, uh, in 2019, 
4,658 new startup companies were launched in Israel, which means that uh, there is one startup company per 2,000 inhabitants. Startup companies raised uh, uh, 8.3 billion US dollars, which is uh, uh, quite an increase over uh, 2018. The data was shown before, which was 5.3 billion dollars. Now, uh, next slide, please. The startup nation phenomenon uh, is a result of uh, uh, several factors. Next slide, Max, please. First is the Israeli DNA, what we call in Israel the chutzpah factor. Uh, chutzpah is a very unique uh, word describing uh, behavior, which is not always uh, uh, a conform behavior. Just to give you an example, uh, the president of the Technion is standing up on the podium and giving a talk. And one of the students stand up and say, Professor Lavi, you don't know what you're talking about. This is a chutzpah. And this is something that is very characteristic of Israelis. They uh, uh, say what they think many times without any filtering. So the chutzpah factor allow you to think out of the box and to do things that uh, everybody around you say, this will be a failure, but you are not afraid of failing. You are not afraid because failure is part of the learning experience. The second reason is necessity is the mother of invention. Israel is a small country, not in a friendly environment and must produce everything by itself. We don't have much natural resources. And uh, as I said, this is a cliche, but it's a very true necessity is indeed the mother of invention. Then we have the human resources. Israelis serve a long time in the military, which is an excellent training ground for future life, for being able to deal with failures, being able to deal with teamwork, etc. Then we had the miracle of immigration. Israel absorbed about a million people coming from the former Soviet Union who came to Israel highly educated, highly motivated, and immediately assumed a leading position in industry. And then there is the government support uh, that provide a very nice uh, system of support for newly uh, established companies. And then there is the Technion's factor or the university's factor on which I would like to uh, uh, focus today. Next slide, please. In order for a university to become uh, uh, important, in order to become a leader of an ecosystem of innovation, there are three major issues that have to be addressed by any university. First, the mission of the university. Not all universities see their mission as serving society. Many look at their mission as accumulating of new knowledge. I believe that universities also should provide service to humanity, service to society. So the mission of the university must be very clearly and very clearly defined. Then research. Many universities look at practical research or applied research as a, a research of a second uh, or a lower uh, importance than basic research. Universities should foster, should uh, support both basic and practical research. And it's very interesting, the Technion uh, uh, inauguration, uh, um, the cornerstone was laid in 1912, but the first class started in 1924 because of First World War. And during the uh, uh, opening speech, the man who made the speech, a very known, renowned uh, leader said, in his opening remarks, practical research and basic research are the two sides of the same coin. And this has become part of the Technion DNA. Then education. Universities should focus on two aspects of education, which are uh, important for uh, uh, creating an uh, ecosystem of innovation. Uh, startup related skills, what is called in other uh, places soft skills, and I'll talk about them, and meeting of minds. And why meeting of minds? Next slide, please. Because creativity is a social process. Creativity is no longer the Eureka phenomenon of somebody who is sitting in his tub and shout, I found it, Eureka. Creativity is a social process. It needs meeting of minds, meeting of minds of students, meeting of minds of students and faculty, meetings of minds of students, faculty and industry, and also very important, 
meeting of minds from different cultures. When you have this meeting of minds, you have creativity and you have innovations. Next, please. Now, Technion has a variety of activities in order to encourage students to become innovative and to become entrepreneurs. We have a, a, a variety of ways in which we uh, in not only encourage the students, but also provide them with the education needed to become an entrepreneur. Just uh, in 2019, we have 4,300, almost half of the undergraduate students who registered for activities related to innovation and creativity. We have 75 events on campus related to this ecosystem, four roundtables, three active areas within the campus where creativity was practiced, 30 faculty lectures, three hackathons in which 500 people stayed all day until 10 o'clock at night in different areas. We have special workshops to encourage on to educate students regarding soft skills, uh, how to communicate, how to present your ideas, how to stand on your uh, ideas, how to argue, how to work in a team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these are needed by entrepreneurs and usually universities are not addressing these issues. Then we have meeting of minds. We have meeting of students from aeronautical engineering and electrical engineering, from medicine and electrical engineering, from medicine and even civil engineering and provide them with challenges, provide them with challenges and they have to provide an idea that will make this world a better place. And then we have meeting of minds between Technion alumni who have made it and they address students. And you can see on uh, uh, one of these meetings of thousands of students with one of our most successful alumni. Next slide, please. And the fruits are very, very impressive. This is some statistics I did before I uh, uh, retired from the Technion. During a 10 period, 10 year period, 1,602 companies were founded or managed by 1,319 Technion graduates, creating 100,000 100, jobs. The total number of uh, 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 merging and acquisition raised about 40 billion US dollars. Some of these graduates started multi uh, uh, companies. The record was 39 companies started by one of our alumni, which is quite impressive. Next slide, please. Now, uh, it is also important to have meeting of cultures. Uh, during my tenure as a president of the Technion, I managed to uh, uh, lead the Technion to open two branches, one in New York in, uh, on Roosevelt Island together with Cornell University. It's called JTCI, Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute, and one in Guangdong in, in, Shan, in the city of Shantau. And uh, uh, these two uh, uh, branches of the Technion uh, uh, close the, or create a bridge between West and East. It is interesting that the branch in New York was opened because Mayor Bloomberg, at that time, the mayor of New York asked universities to open a branch in New York in order to help the economy of New York. He realized that creating an ecosystem of innovation and creativity needs an academic support. And the Technion, together with Cornell, participated in a competition that was open to more than 50 universities. And we provided a program that was tailor-made to the economy of New York. This has now become a very important institute in New York, providing education in a new way that think about the economy of the ecosystem around it. Very, very successful project. So meeting of cultures is very, very important for creativity and innovation. Next, please. So I truly believe that uh, um, universities can play a major role in creating an ecosystem of creativity innovation. Universities are important for this process and they can be the engine behind the success of Shenzhen, the success of Israel or the success of New York. We must take this role. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Levi. I think in the short span of 15 minutes, you actually managed uh, very impressively to articulate about Putzpa, the spirit that drives uh, Israeli innovation, 
and uh, I'm very impressed by you know your founding president's uh, push towards basic and practical research. All right, that uh, your articulation that creativity is a social process, uh, and uh, I think what caught my attention was your meeting of minds, all right, where you have that ecosystem which is deliberate through your tea days, tea meet, tea school, tea challenge, all right, to engender innovation and creativity uh, on campus and beyond. And uh, you spread the idea of meeting of minds to meeting of cultures by establishing in the West, uh, tech, Cornell Tech, and in the East, Guangdong Tech. Uh, extremely impressive. And thank you very much, I'm sure uh, the uh, attendees here would have lots of questions for you. Thank you. And uh, next, I think uh, I'd like to invite my very good friend, uh, Shui, uh, the immediate past president of the South Southern University of Science and Technology, or SUSTEC. Now, this is a very young university, and I'll let Shui actually uh, highlight uh, some of the achievements uh, of SUSTEC under his reign. Thank you. Shri, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Let me share my screen with you. Let me see this. Okay, can you see my screen? Chairman? Excellent. Okay, Please, thank, you. thank you for inviting me. The thank you to the organizers. So I'm just uh, finished my appointment as the president of SUSTEC. I want to talk about SUSTEC's 10 years exploratory journey in the research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And uh, this is a 10 years university. I came to this university about six years ago. So I did six years job. And uh, Shenzhen is uh, in Southern China. Uh, this is a map of China, you can see it. And uh, uh, Shenzhen is the center of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, Greater Bay Area. And uh, Shenzhen just recently named as a national uh, pilot demonstration area, which will stimulate uh, the Chinese economic development for the whole country. And uh, Shenzhen has uh, uh, now is regarded to be a China's hub of innovation, even though it only has a 40 Yes, history. We just celebrated uh, last uh, uh, August. And uh, uh, Shenzhen has a population of about 22 million. And, uh, you know, uh, there are 75% they are migrants. Every age is very young, 32.5. And GDP is about 417 billion US dollars. Uh, in the 2019, a 6.7% increase. I don't know 2020 you know, because of COVID-19. And uh, the number one Chinese cities in GDP per capita since 2007. And tech companies uh, 70,000 plus. Uh, Fortune Global 500, we have about eight. And it's the top one among Chinese cities in PCD uh, application, which is way, way ahead. So uh, Shenzhen's uh, the, the technology needs you know, in the last 40 years uh, provide uh, great opportunities for universities. Uh, Shenzhen has uh, uh, emerged as an emerging innovative uh, metropolis, which has like uh, four pillars in the major industry, like high tech, finance services, logistics, creative industry, and also has strategic emerging industry, which occupy about 41% of GDP. And uh, also they just list a future industry like life science, ocean economy, space and astronomy and intelligent equipment and so on and so forth. So Shenzhen uh, in the last 40 years is quite successful, has become China's as uh, a major, major city for innovation and the economy uh, uh, growth has been a role model for Chinese economy. And uh, uh, universities, let's talk about uh, Shenzhen uh, University, which is the oldest one was established about 30 years ago. And SUSTEC was established about 10 years ago. And the moment we have 13 universities in Shenzhen, including like uh, Beida's Shenzhen campus and Tsinghua and uh, many others. And there's uh, 
in the camp in the universities, we have about 120,000 college students. Uh, I remember there's, there's a, a book by Tom Spencer, the university in the city, the uh, famous quote, uh, a city without a major university is an incomplete city. So Shenzhen recognized that. I gave all the speeches to the leaders in the city. So they recognized we need to establish and help uh, like Sustech, Shenzhen University to become a major university in the region in China and in the world. So university can provide and talent, innovation and culture, help the culture establishment. And uh, where the city can provide the funds and land in a very important in Shenzhen. Shenzhen only has about 2000 square kilometers compared with other major cities. Shenzhen really lack of the land, also resources. Of course, uh, Shenzhen has uh, uh, provided us with a very uh, good funds and resources, but not the land. And as a mission of Go, I think I, I echo the previous speaker. Uh, you know, for us, there's a mission to serve, a mission to innovate, and the universe has a, and the goal to become a world-class university. Like mission to serve, we want to serve, uh, contribute to innovative development of China, boost the economy and society progress of Guangdong and help Shenzhen become modern, international and innovative city. Also from beginning, the Ministry of, Ch of China, Ministry of Education in China, uh, give us a, a, a task, a three tasks to be, become a pilot higher education reform and become a test bed for excellent research university practice and also develop a Chinese modern university system. So in fact, because we are new, uh, we are allowed to do something uh, different from traditional universities. We have three goals, one to cultivate the future leaders, that's the education program, and to conduct high quality research and to become an engine for the regional sustainable development. So both the city and university are startups. And uh, at the moment, after 10 years, you know, we have about 500 tenure track faculty about 1,000 researchers, uh, 4,500 uh, undergraduate students and 3,500 graduate students. We have eight uh, schools, like College of Sciences, Engineering, Life Science, uh, Business, and Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which is quite unusual uh, in, in China and also in the world, and College of Humanity and Social Studies. We don't admit undergraduate students in humanity and social studies. We just recently uh, established a school of medicine. Also, we, we just started a school called School of Design, Creative Design, essentially. And uh, we also, within the College of Engineering, we have established a school of system design and intelligent manufacturing, which is very much like all in college type. One plus three curriculum plus innovative pedagogy. First year, we allow students to take like traditional courses, more intensive program. Uh, second year and third year, we uh, essentially establish quite a different program, essentially like a project-based learning, student-centered curriculum, group le uh, learning, exp expand experiential learning, and branded learning. In the last year, we hope them to do uh, some societal needs, to meet the societal needs, industrial needs, business startup practice and design competition. We open up this kind of like, uh, you know, for a uh, competition to get into this school. You know, we only have 30 slots because we don't have, we don't want uh, many students to join from the beginning, we want to test it. Turn out there are more than 100 uh, students, compete 10% of our students competing for 30 uh, positions. So it's quite a popular. Uh, we also measure the student by the all-round assessment, like knowledge absorption, self-driven motivation, academic writing, oral expression, multidisciplinary integration, and critical thinking, creativity, and teamwork, that's very important, leadership, systematic thinking, and planning and time management. So all-round assessment. It turned out quite successful, also quite popular at the moment. And as a research at the SUSTEC, it turned out quite successful, thank to the strong support from city and our uh, faculty, very uh, competitive. You know, it turned out the research grant 
per capita, we are within top five in the nation. We have over 3,000 uh, university in China and the citation per capita, we are number one. Uh, for nation index in the whole world, within 10 years, we are number 52 now. Asia, 18. In China, we are 14. And it's just, it's a, you know, increase uh, how, how good we are doing in the research in terms of just one measure and for the nation index. From THE and QS ranking for the world uh, young universe in 2020, we both of them rank SUSTEC number one in China for last 50 years. And uh, we have established a tech transfer ecosystem at the SUSTEC through so the service provided by tech transfer office and support from all parts of the university. And uh, also from industry, you know, also from education uh, foundation, alumni association. Also, we have established so-called club of entrepreneurs. And uh, so this organization we have created, uh, I think it's quite nice ecosystem uh, for the uh, tech transfer. You know, so like fundamental research to the, com uh, the technology breakthroughs and the commercialization. So like a patent application, product development, industry needs, tech thing support, contract negotiation, and also this, so this why, you know, you saw all the universities, uh, uh, branches and divisions, academic units, industrial research institutes, asset management company and engine funds, and so on and so forth. So uh, the uh, entrepreneurship, education and entrepreneurship spirit uh, are very important for SUSTEC because we are in the best uh, location. Uh, if we don't use the Shenzhen as opportunity, we will be uh, another uh, Chinese university. So the tech transfer, we have several features. One is a policy. Uh, we implement 70% of tech transfer incomes. We give it to the investors, in inventors. Also, the patents, uh, you know, typically in US and uh, in most places in China, they're owned by universities. Uh, at SUSTAC, we allow the patents owned jointly by university inventors, if essentially 75% owned by uh, the inventors. One day per week for startups, and if they can work for their own company, that's really typically forbidden in the uh, US. Also for other outside uh, the uh, campus. Entrepreneurship sabbatical leave up to three years which is quite unusual for, I, I came back from US. You know. About 20% master degree students partially supported and co-supervised by industry partners. So we allow many industry partners to come as advisors, as a professors and so on and so forth. Also we provide a funding like Shenzhen Fund of Angel Fund, Sustec Angel Fund, a deep collaboration with investors and provide a lot of funding for startups uh, coming from uh, technology invention from our faculty. And also we give support in tech thing, tech uh, thing support. And uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, four or five years, the university and industry have established a strong cooperation. You know, we established joint labs with uh, local en uh, enterprises. So we have 40 plus, like with the Huawei, with the uh, ZICT joint lab on artificial intelligence, and we have established SUSTEC Aero Next Journal Lab of Flying Robots uh, Technology. And also, universities uh, help the faculty establish uh, 60 plus start startup companies in the last five years. For example, Professor Wang Haijian, uh, who is a really a world leader in fuel cell technology. And Professor Chen Chunmiao is a chair professor uh, who is doing a, a uh, pollution treatment technology for surface water, soil, and then groundwater. I want to mention this young uh, uh, guy. Uh, he came back from Hong Kong and he graduated from Hong Kong. He's a professor, a uh, social professor now. He started as it's called Sutan Technology Limited, which invented a new micro LED technology for the future display. Uh, I think that's a great, great application uh, possible to replace the past technology in display. This is a young guy and his company is doing attract a lot of mutual fund, uh, uh, mutual fund uh, and PE and so on and so forth. 
one of our students, you know, Professor. Please, 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 please. You have about four or five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Zhang Ji, and uh, he invented uh, this antifog disinfection uh, material. He, uh, he was met by Chinese Prime Minister uh, Li Keqiang. Uh, you know, he was a very successful uh, student, graduate from Sustech, they became a CEO of company uh, based on a professor as a and uh, uh, he himself developed technology. He's now become an alumni. And also Sustech, in fact, uh, work closely with the city. You can see that from this, our logo uh, spread everywhere in the city, you know, Sustech across the whole city and dedicated to becoming the new engine of the city, especially the uh, medical schools. We have three medical schools. We have about 10 research labs and uh, tech transfer centers in the city. And also we organized in the last three years with our international partners. We, we started so-called International Forum on Technology Transfer for three years. You can see 2018, 2019, and 13, uh, 2020, uh, bridging 500 local en enterprises with overseas partner universities. Over 60 research results commercialized. One thing I want to mention to you also because we have a lot uh, a lot of colleagues from different uh, universities in Asia. We will encourage you to join us. You know, we have industry uh, partnership at Shenzhen and abroad program, and to partnership experience plus industry internship at Shenzhen with NUS, SNU, MIT, and uh, UQ, uh, Queensland, HEC Paris. So we have uh, also organized the so-called defense uh, challenge camps open to all people in the world, all students in the world once a year. So we encourage your students to come to study abroad plus overseas industry internship. So, uh, so all this, I would like to emphasize our philosophy to become a research, innovative, fashion, and entrepreneurship university. So we think that new research will give you a new discovery and uh, so innovation will give you a new technology and entrepreneurship will give, give you added a new value. Then we will, when you finish entrepreneurship, you will get a new value, you will feed it back to research. So this is really a very nice, so we invest money back to research. Here, tech transfer, transfer your technology to make money. So research will make a breakthrough and support the innovation. So you, we have sustained, sustaining this kind of education and neutral education to interact. That's the idea we are uh, doing at the SUSTAC. I hope in the next 10 years, we'll go even beyond what we have achieved today. Uh, thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Shi. Again, I think within 20 minutes, I think you were able to actually give us a very good overview uh, on the achievements of uh, SUSTAC. It is indeed remarkable that uh, you are a startup and you probably are like a unicorn now in the sense of a startup, right? And uh, you have more than fulfilled, you know, the mission that uh, your government has set to, right? To groom future leaders. I think you already have 60 uh, very well uh, sort of vibrant startups uh, from your professors, high quality research and uh, to be the engine of growth uh, for Shenzhen. And I think that one of the slides, which has the map of where your uh, institutes and your facilities are spread out across the churn, I think tells quite a bit of the story. And I think finally you encapsulate everything in terms of research, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Again, thank you very much, I think, for sharing. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Have uh, we already have a few questions and uh, we have about 45 minutes or so uh, for questions. And if I may, uh, I would like to uh, go right into the first question. And let me read the question so that uh, our participants can have some time to think about it. Now, regarding meeting of minds between students, faculty and industrial entrepreneurs, how do we make sure that faculty members are practically minded, know the industry and what they need, 
rather than textbook oriented uh, and academic stuff. Thank you. This is uh, an excellent question and a very important one. In my experience, if you take uh, the population of faculty members, in the Technion we have uh, a total of 570 full-time faculty members. And you rank them according to their interest in uh, the issue of uh, creating startups, commercialization, applied research, you have a normal distribution. On one side, you have faculty members who have no interest whatsoever in applied research. They would like to continue doing their basic research, accumulating new knowledge, discovering the laws of nature. Don't bother them with any application of their findings. On the other side, you have a small group of faculty members that they have the fire in their belly. They would like to apply their findings for the benefit of society and the benefit of humanity. These are two small groups relatively. In the middle, most of the faculty members can be persuaded either way. So when you try to create an ecosystem of innovation, entrepreneurship, and to start activities on campus, you naturally go to the group that already is convinced. And don't expect that every faculty member will be on your side. Start with those that have the fire in their belly. Then it will spread over. So you need, I always give the example of two of our Nobel laureates, Professor Avram Hershko and Professor Aaron Chekanover. They won the Nobel Prize for the ubiquitin system in chemistry. Professor Hershko doesn't want to hear about commercialization or applied research. He continue, even after retiring, to continue doing his research in his own hands. Aaron Chikanova, on the other hand, is supporting commercialization, supporting applied research, and is an engine, a power of engine. And he is a role model for a researcher who would like to apply his findings for the benefit of society. So this is my answer. Find among your faculty members, the group that have the fire in their belly, that would like to follow this line, then it will become a much more spread phenomenon. Wow. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, finding uh, good role models and then uh, make sure that they infect the others with that enthusiasm and hunger. And I thought I can just reframe the question slightly to Shi Yi. I mean, for an upstart university like uh, Sustec, I mean, to have actually 60 faculty members or projects which uh, can spin off companies, uh, that's something quite impressive. How did you do it? Well, uh, China's situation is quite different from like uh, 10 or even five years ago. The Chinese uh, government now uh, strongly uh, encourage uh, faculty and professors, researchers to do uh, apply uh, science, to do entrepreneurship. And that's one thing, you know, they are in fact they set a, a, a several kind of policies uh, in at national level. Second, Shenzhen is a very special. Yeah, everyone talk about new technology. Everyone is thinking about uh, yeah, new companies like uh, uh, Bay Area. So this is a quite different environment that probably I think is one of the best for entrepreneurship in the world. Uh, third one, and uh, our university policy, in fact, encourage our faculty to think about along that kind of line. Even though having said that, you know, a professor must be promoted from assistant professor to associate professor to full professor and chair professor. We look at uh, their publications and their, you know, uh, their uh, uh, research uh, results and uh, you know nature science and cell and so on and so forth. So professors still there are a lot of professors, especially from science schools, school of science, that they are devoted to do uh, fundamental research. So I think that uh, as a university and you know, as a whole, we should balance that. We encourage you know uh, them to do their best. At the same time, we encourage them to think about you are in a unique position, a unique city. 
So if you have something new and important, you should also think about applying research. So all these kind of like a combination and uh, approaches, I think our faculty now know that it's important to think about to balance both fundamental research, applied research, and uh, startup, uh, start your own company. One time I say, I said, let's learn from MIT. If every faculty per capita, you have one company, I'm fine with it. Thank so, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think one benefit, of course, of a uh, uh, startup uh, innovation ecosystem like Sunchen, earlier I mentioned there are 70,000 tech companies. And uh, in your presentation, you also mentioned that you have a lot of collaboration with these companies. That's so right. in fact, one form of collaboration is to stand students for internships. And students, uh, when they intern in this company, they can bring problems back to professors. And that helps to actually strengthen the link between professors and students, and also professors and uh, industry, right? So that they are less academic, uh, they are more exposed to what happens outside. That's Thank right. you for your answers, very good answers. Uh, let me move on to the next question uh, from Ehud Bihar. Uh, I would be happy to hear from panel members in their opinion. How much of university resources uh, would be, oops. Oh, sorry, it's moved to the answer tab. If you click on answered, you will see. It. Oh, okay, okay. That's too fast. Okay. Uh, how much of university resources and attention should be focused on their international mission on research and education? And how much more on national missions, technical training and economy? Does the answer depend on geography? For instance, Asia versus US and Europe? And how does it change? between private and state universities? Wow, this is actually a very uh, comprehensive question. Uh, who would like to have a shot at this? How about Levy? It's a balance of resources between uh, your international positioning and your local mission. As you say, very, uh, very complicated question. I cannot give a percentage of time that you, can, uh, you should allocate to uh, uh, national versus international. What I would like to say is globalization is here. There is no doubt about it. Uh, uh, since uh, Thomas Friedman wrote his book about the flat uh, uh, earth, uh, we see uh, uh, globalization as one of the trends of the future and uh, uh, international collaboration is something that we should encourage and uh, I believe that uh, we all do it. I, I, I realize that SASTEC is doing marvelous job in collaboration and Singapore as well. Uh, and the Technion uh, joined the group uh, in the last few years. Uh, the quality of research and the data supporting it, the quality of research that come out of international collaboration is much higher than the quality of research of national collaboration. I remember I asked Elsevier to do a project for me to compare the number of citations of papers that came out of international collaboration between a researcher from the Technion and researcher from any university outside Israel, compare it to collaboration of researchers from the Technion and other Israeli university and researcher from the Technion itself. And it was amazing the quality, the number of citations of international collaborations was significantly higher than any other collaboration. So international uh, collaboration or focusing on international collaboration should be part or should be on the mind of every university president. How much time to allocate is dependent on the needs of the country. Some countries need much more attention nationally some countries need less attention uh, 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 locally. And this is something that cannot be generalized, in my opinion, across all countries and across all universities. But the fact is that globalization is very important. And this is why we decided to open branches outside Israel, which provide us with meeting of minds across cultures. 
this is something which is unique. In, in Haifa, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, there are R&D centers of every major uh, uh, multinational company, IBM and Microsoft and Apple and, uh, um, and uh, uh, Intel and all of them and Amazon, all of them have research and development center in Haifa. And our students spend more time sometime in these R&D centers than in the classrooms but they must be exposed to multicultural education. And this is very important. So I cannot give percentages, but it should be on the mind of every university president. Ah, thank you. It's a very delicate balance, that's to say. <laughs> yes, Sri, any comments from you? Yeah, I just give one number. And in fact, you know, for our undergraduate students, once they finish four years uh, education, uh, about 40% of our students go abroad for uh, 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 graduate education. About 30% they stay in, uh, in China for graduate education. With a 30% of our students, they go to industries and they go to work. So add up together, we have a 60% of our students stay essentially in China. 40% of our students go abroad to continue their studies. So I don't know exact number, but I think 40, 60 sounds quite reasonable uh, in terms of our education program. Uh, of course, we are also working very hard to look into our, uh, uh, to form a partnership with our international uh, friends and colleagues, especially we just started a new uh, joint uh, medical school with King's College. And uh, we st uh, probably will start next year to admit uh, 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 undergraduate students and we also work closely with MIT, HEC Paris for different kind of like an area uh, of interest. So I think it's a, a globalization and uh, to cultivate our student to be a global citizen is very important for a world-class university like us. We hope uh, to continue this kind of path. At the same time, I think, you know, whatever you do, you got support from China, you got education uh, in Shenzhen. I think uh, we should think uh, you know, keep the, the, uh, the domestic agenda in mind, which is equally important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can just also answer from my aspect, uh, it's going to be a delicate balance. Uh, it's also definitely not a zero one uh, sort of an issue. Right, uh, and uh, the balance uh, depends also on the country, on how much your government is supporting you. But sometimes I don't think we should see it as a dichotomy in the sense that uh, uh, local research is bad or local based research is bad, uh, local based training is bad, uh, global is better. Uh, I think uh, universities, uh, we know our strengths, our weaknesses and you want to extract from our strengths and leverage on them, all right? And you can still do excellent research that benefits the local mission as well as the global mission too, all right? Which I guess many of us are doing. And in these days, uh, a lot of the problems uh, are actually very important problems regardless of context, right? And uh, that's where I think uh, a lot of collaboration will be required. Uh, we have a next interesting question uh, by W.T. Poon. If three of you are invited back to the same seminar 10 years from now, post-COVID, uh, would you be still giving the same presentation? Can I send it to Sri? <laughs> wow, well, and I think it will be quite different. And you know, at the moment I'm talking because we are just a startup, uh, like a startup company, startup uh, university. So we try to uh, learn from uh, 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 all the schemes, all the methods from uh, our friends from different universities. At the same time, we try to uh, test all kinds of different approaches to adapt, to help as a city. I think we are 10 years later, uh, probably we will have uh, some success. So I should share with you more on uh, just like uh, you know, a professor from Israel, uh, talking about how many uh, companies, how many startups, how many uh, uh, our company go to public IPOs. I think is uh, you know how many our student uh, becomes a world leader in academia. 
uh, in, in the industry. So I think 10 years later, my presentation, if I would have the chance, would be quite different. Thank you. Levy? My, my presentation will be different too. We are facing, and uh, a lot was uh, uh, talked about, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, my grandchildren who start now the first grade, when they join the job market, let's say in uh, 25 years or 20 years, half of the jobs will disappear that exist now, and half of the job will be new jobs. The universities must adapt to the needs of the fourth industrial revolution. There is no doubt in my mind. We start to see this trend and this process going on, but we're still at the, at the start. Interdisciplinary research, interdisciplinary teaching, uh, emphasis on the machine learning and uh, I, e, uh, AI, um, the issue of uh, precision uh, uh, medicine, all these terms that now are very vague and very, uh, uh, you know, uh, floating in the air will become concrete. I have no doubt about it. Universities are very conservative. To change, I was a dean of medicine, and I remember when I tried to change the curriculum of the faculty of medicine, people told me, it will take you 10 years to do it. Take what, look what happened around the world. You cannot change a curriculum. Well, it took me 11 months, but we will have to change the curriculum in order to adapt to the digital era. So I truly believe that in, in 10 years, my presentation will be different, uh, not because of the goals of a university or the uh, uh, mission of a university, but because of what are needed in order to adapt to the changes in society in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you have said it very well, and uh, I can only concur with you that things change so fast. Uh, it's, uh, I can't even predict what will happen in five years' time. All right. And you know that typically it takes four years to train a student, <laughs> <laughs> and five right. years at least to train a PhD student. And that's the frightening part. Uh, but that also means that universities have to adapt and be very nimble and change, all right, to adapt to the evolving env environment. And this is challenging. But I think the universities that can survive are those that are more nimble and more adaptable to rapid changes. Uh, can we move on to the next question? Uh, and I think this one should be a, a fairly straightforward one, although hard to execute. I think uh, the, it, is, it comes from an anonymous attendee who says that what is more important for building a good education system in our country? If I may say quickly, I would say good resources, good teachers, all right, and a good system. The, que the question is what country? Uh <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, well, you know, the history of the Technion is very unique. Why suddenly uh, Institute of Higher Education was built among, uh, uh, in the Middle East, Cornerstone was laid in 1912, when Palestine at that time was under the Ottoman Empire uh, ruling. The reason was very simple. It was a mission. At that time, the Jews couldn't study medicine, science, and engineering in Europe because of numerous clauses. So there was a decision to open a Jewish university in the Holy Land. And it was a university that was built to provide education to those that were denied education. From there, when the country was built, the technical became a cornerstone of engineering because the country needed engineers. So every country have a different needs of education. And I truly believe that you again, again cannot generalize why to open a university in New York or in Guangdong uh, uh, to open a university in Kenya or in uh, uh, Zimbabwe. So these are countries with different needs 
And this is why universities have to be tailor-made to the geographical area. But I agree with you, you need resources, you need excellent teachers, and you need a system. And uh, uh, this is how to do it. No doubt about it, when the motivating power behind it is different from a country to country. Yeah. Well, I must take my hat to you that uh, you actually put the uh, Cornell Tech and uh, Guangdong Tech in place during your presidency. And that is actually a very, very ambitious and very visionary uh, uh, initiatives. And, and again, the reason behind the two universities was different. As I said, Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, looked at the Silicon Valley, look at Boston and say, I'm envy of these two places. I'd like to New York to become a capital of technology. And he challenged universities to open a university that will address the needs of New York. In Guangdong, it was the idea of Mr. Li Ka Xing uh, from Hong Kong that we should bring the spirit of entrepreneurship, the spirit of startup nation to Shantau in order to encourage what now I see is an excellent model in Sustec, exactly what they are doing. And uh, I believe that these are two, again, two different motivations. Here is to bring a spirit, here is to address really uh, economic needs of a city. And uh, we learn a lot from these two experiences. Thank you, Levi. Uh, Shri, would you like to add? I think you said all, oh, I don't have much to add. Uh, in addition to what all you uh, two of you said, I, I think that uh, very in, uh, important lesson I learned, uh, probably we as educator, we should work well with the, the stakeholders, uh, you know, all resources and all the uh, people. And uh, in China, it's, the situation is equally complex as uh, other countries. So to be able to work with well with the government, with the local people, uh, with the industries, I think that's a very important. Uh, in other words, we should uh, define our mission. What's a goal, a mission of our university? That's also echo uh, to uh, Lavin say, you know, in different countries, you have a different kind of like a, 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 a kind of mission for you, different kind of like a, 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 a future plan. So I think all this add up. Thank you very much, Shi. Uh, very good uh, addition. Uh, next, I think we have a very strategic and I think a very uh, important question for all of us, uh, posed by Christina Chan. Uh, the question is, could you please comment on the impact of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, and the EU-China investment deal on the next five years plan of your university? What challenges and opportunities do they pose for Asian universities, especially in areas of innovation? I thought this is a very nice strategic question. I believe this address to both of you, less to me. <laughs> I think the EU part would affect you a little bit. Yeah. Okay, Sri, would you like to comment? EU? I don't have, no, uh, have much knowledge about the EU. Not the EU, but the, the regional uh, comprehensive uh, regional co collaboration. Oh, well, I, mean, uh, I can tell you uh, the challenge we are facing now, you know, uh, because we are new university, uh, you know, in China, we have so-called a double world-class university kind of a class. We are none of them. We are not first-class university. We're not so-called first-class a uh, 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 world discipline university. So uh, Chinese central government, you know, uh, classify the universe in different kind of category, even though we are doing in the all, you know, aspects, we are doing very well uh, uh, globally. You know, so we are uh, kind of like uh, running into kind of problems. So we are working closely with the Ministry of Education. So as a startup up university, we are always facing that kind of issue, you know, uh, be recognition by uh, your local people, by uh, uh, central government, also by the world. Let me also share one thing with you. Our students apply a, a, a position, graduate students in Europe, 
and I won a, a, a several university in, in, in England. They got a, a, a letter, reject letter, saying that because your university is not ranked by Chinese government as a first class world university, you are not, we are not going to admit you. So I think the history, you know, it uh, does matter for many universities. At a startup company, like in the startup uh, city, we are facing a lot of challenges, especially not for the next five years. China started, uh, uh, this is for, uh, for uh, 14 five years economic plan. So we, we are working on that. I think we are going to get the strong support from city and provisional leaders and a pro a province, but we are facing some challenges and nationwide. So we have to talk with them. We have to work hard on that to demonstrate it. And you know, to speed up an education program is not that simple. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Yi. And uh, if I sort of may share uh, Singapore's perspective, uh, Singapore, of course, is involved in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP. And uh, uh, as you are aware, I think this partnership would mean that uh, the countries that are involved in RCEP would have actually uh, quite a bit of trade and uh, sort of a free trade amongst this country. And uh, that means that there's access to market will be open uh, to our innovations, right? And that actually would uh, posture well for Asian universities, which are in countries in RCEP, because uh, this is basically enlarging the market in which your innovation uh, can find uh, your products, you know, can find customers, can find demand. Uh, and I think there's now more opportunities, I would say, uh, for countries that are involved in RCEP. Likewise, I think the EU-China investment agreement uh, is something slightly different. But again, investments are tied uh, to innovations as well. Especially in these days, uh, a lot of the high-tech investments are something which uh, people take a lot of interest Again, an agreement like that uh, is really opening up opportunities for universities uh, to be able to uh, seed and to spread their innovation products uh, across the countries of collaboration. So I think that augurs well, but uh, it also depends on which country and uh, what sort of innovations and how your university is positioning. Uh, but I think generally, uh, this in the past, of course, we have the globalization where you, you try to make things unimpeded uh, in terms of innovation. But uh, this sort of recent years, there's been a pullback in terms of globalization. And that's why RCEP and the EU China agreement uh, is of importance. And uh, it's also quite illuminating why these countries that are involved uh, had the agreements actually agreed upon last year, all right, during the pandemic year, right? I think people see the importance. So thank you. Uh, let's, let's move on to the next question. Uh, and I think this is uh, a question which I'm sure she has uh, uh, heard before. How would China nurture a homegrown Nobel Prize winner in basic sciences? Wow, that's a, well, I don't have crystal ball, but I believe, you know, with the patient and with the continued support on basic science, China will be there. I know several uh, very distinguished people that are doing uh, excellent research. Uh, I, I believe within five years, you know, uh, I think there's something in the, like FedEx in chemistry. Uh, I think uh, we will get a Nobel Prize. So don't worry about it. I think I learned from Japan. They start about 30 or 40 years ago. You see they are uh, in a flourish in that direction. So I just say, be patient. Thank you. I think that's an excellent answer. Uh, and to use uh, Japan as an illustration, right? Uh, uh, that, that, uh, Time will come. And that's, that's when I think you will see a critical mass of Nobel Prize winners. 
Okay, very good. Now, the next question is actually uh, also targeted at Sustag. But if I may delay this and I jump to Tony's question, because uh, I'd like the Levy to uh, answer this. And uh, Tony Chan's question is for us, what's Technion's experience in China, in particular with the Technion Guangdong Institute of Technology Development? Any just, uh, just brief comments, thank you. Well, uh, generally we had a very uh, good and interesting experience. As I said, I mentioned before, uh, uh, everybody asked me what is the difference between opening a branch in New York and a branch in China. And I said, there is a huge difference. In New York, the Minister of Education of the US never invited me. In China, I was invited to Beijing by the Minister of Education to discuss the new uh, uh, project. So there was attention. There was attention by the governor of Guangdong. There was attention by the Minister of Education. We have uh, uh, an am amazing, amazing uh, uh, investment in the uh, infrastructure. And uh, uh, we generally had an excellent experience in constructing the campus. To build a campus within one year is something that uh, I look back and I don't believe it happened from the day that the uh, uh, cornerstone was laid until we started teaching, it was one year. Uh, on the other hand, there was some uh, uh, regulations that we are not used to in, in the West. And uh, these are things that uh, uh, we have to adapt uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the curriculum, how to approve the curriculum and uh, uh, how to uh, deal with uh, uh, research. And uh, uh, I would say that I was favorably surprised. And uh, we, my, my greatest fear in opening a branch in China was how to make sure that we have a real international faculty members, how to attract excellent faculty members to Guangdong to Shantao, which is not Shanghai and not Shenzhen and not even Beijing. We advertised that we are looking for faculty members in the areas that we started teaching in uh, uh, China. And I was shocked. In two months, we got 638 candidates. And they apply for the job in, uh, uh, um, in Guangdong. We identified 40 of them that were at the academic uh, uh, level that each one of them could be accepted to the Technion. We interviewed them and uh, half of them were offered a job in Guangdong and moved to Guangdong. And when I asked them, why are you doing it? Why are you leaving a university in Canada or in Australia or in, or in uh, uh, one who came from Denmark? Why are you doing it? They gave me two answers very interestingly. One, it's a challenge to open this university in China, a Western-like university in China. And second, we'd like to be affiliated with you in the Technion. So the experience was good. Now, because of, of course, the pandemic, uh, uh, it's a rough time. And uh, uh, I hope that this is not going to be a hurdle that uh, uh, will lead to uh, regression of the university. We found the students exceptional, really exceptional. And uh, we had a panel just before I retired from presidency, we had a visit, uh, a grand visit to uh, uh, J GTIIT, Guangdong Technion. And I asked the students, what did you get from studying uh, in uh, uh, GTIIT? One of them stood up and he say, now I'm a chutzpah. I know how to do chutzpah. So in a way, we managed to bring the spirit to uh, Chantal, and I'm very happy about it. Yeah. Well, just a quick one. Did you have a choice which city you want to base your university in? Uh, or was Chantal <laughs> given to you? <laughs> um, can you... Can you repeat the question? I... Why, why did, did you choose Santo? Ah, I see, I see, okay. Did you we choose, didn't choose Chantal? Chantal. Uh, yeah. Chantal was chosen by Mr. Li Ka Xing. Ah, yes. Mr. Li Ka Xing was born in Chantal. 
he opened STU, Shantao University, as a gift to the Chinese people because he was born. He left China when he was nine years old when the Japanese invaded, together with his father. His father was a teacher, and they went to Hong Kong, where he became a very, very wealthy uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, person. So he gave back to China STU, and then he convinced me to open the uh, branch of the Technion, and uh, he picked a site very close to STU. And I must say that the governor of Guangdong, Governor Zhu, who retired also, became a very close friend. And I was very impressed with his dedication and his vision of having Guangdong uh, uh, a, a citadel of science and entrepreneurship. And what I see in Shenzhen prove that he was right. And uh, Sastek is an amazing, amazing success. And uh, this is due to the leadership in Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know from uh, my good friend Tashen that uh, Mr. Li Kashin, and for those who don't know Li Kashin, uh, he's one of, he's the richest man in Hong Kong and one of the richest in Asia. And uh, he has actually very high regards for Technion Institute of Technology. <laughs> That's why I think he wants you to build you know, a replica in Shanto. All right, uh, we, we have a question for Shi Yi. Uh, this is directed to Sustek. And uh, it came from an, an anonymous attendee. And it, uh, the question is, I noticed that Sustek has something called the Industrial Research Institute, which may or may not be similar to in composition and mission as the Frank Hofer Institutes. My question is, how essential is an engineering design or technical staff in contrast to researchers within a university for supporting early to meet TRL, right? These are translational research levels or technology readiness level uh, translation activities. I ask because this is where many ideas falter before licensing or commercialization. Uh, any quick comments, Sri? Well, uh, that's an a, a interesting, a tough question, you know, to comment uh, about uh, the, like a uh, 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 technical uh, stuff, the role, uh, let me read it, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so supporting uh, about technology readiness and level and so on and so forth. At the SUSTEC, we, in fact, we do have this kind of system, uh, engineering design and technology stuff system. Uh, we have a university level, we have also have a college level, also we have a you know, technical staff supported by a faculty. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, we are, of course, we are not like a Freinhoff Institute because this is a mainly a, a, a education institute, uh, but we do have different kind of systems like a professor, a research professor and research staff and so on and so forth to support our innovation. Uh, we don't have at the moment have a, a, a problem with the licensing and commercialization yet, but uh, I, I probably should uh, be aware uh, about in the future, maybe the licensing or commercialization issue will come up you know, uh, with the team players. Uh, at the moment at the SUSTEC, you know, all the patents are owned by PIs, designed by PI which may not be the uh, best approach in the future. So uh, thanks for the remind me of this issue. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing uh, that I think when you ask sort of issues like TRL, the Chinese environment may be a bit different. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the certain environment is also interesting in the sense that, uh, like I've said earlier, certain has 70,000 tech companies. That's right. So they are actually very, very efficient. In fact, I would say, in some cases, more efficient than the Western countries in terms of translation. That's and right. That's you, right. You, you'll be amazed how they can actually do fast prototyping. Yeah. All right. Within five days, if you give them a prototype, they can manufacture 1,000, 5,000 just yeah. within five days. Uh, I don't see it's it. It's like being a new company. <laughs> it's it's so fast, uh, and that's one part of it. When you talk about the uh, translation, 
And, but uh, Sitchin has a very different uh, ecosystem. And I think uh, the ecosystem, the INE ecosystem, uh, do have certain characteristics of the place and the people and the culture. Yeah. Right? And that's, that's why it is interesting to see systems, say, in Israel, in US, in China, in Shenzhen, you know, what, how it differs. But thanks very much. I think that's a very nice question. Uh, we have about another five minutes, so probably we can take one or two more questions. Uh, uh, this is a question. Uh, uh, well, I'll see whether we have... Uh, okay, uh, this is from uh, an audience uh, who has not, whose question has not been uh, taken. Uh, as a Cornell graduate, I would like to know more what we can learn from Cornell Technion experiences, obstacles, successes, and mistakes and problems, if you can share with us. Thank you. Very interesting question. I think that uh, the greatest success, if I look back about JTCI, Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute, is the ability to do something that none of the universities can do alone. And this is a building a new educational program from scratch. This is a graduate school. We provide a master and a PhD degree, but in a different environment. The studies are done in a studio environment, very interdisciplinary, very uh, wide education, accepting students from a variety of backgrounds. Believe me, if I would try to uh, uh, institute such a program in the Technion, even 10 years won't take me, even, lo even longer than 10 years. The same is Cornell. But here the success was two universities came and envisioned a new program that has become a model for many, many universities, how to provide the interdisciplinary approach to education and the uh, uh, meeting of minds of students and faculty. So I would say that this is the greatest success. The obstacle is the tuition. Uh, to study in New York, in Cornell, or in any other private American university, take a fortune. So uh, uh, this is an obstacle. We try to raise money to provide with scholarships. Luckily, uh, Mr. Jacobs provides us with a major gift in order to start the program. But I would say that this is the major obstacle, the tuition. Uh, I would prefer uh, to have many, many more students paying less tuition, but uh, uh, this is the way uh, it is done in the US. And uh, to pay something like uh, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars a year just for tuition, it's uh, very, very uh, um, expensive. So the success is the ability to have a new ped pedagogical approach and to install it in a very short period of time and to prove that this is successful. And this is anticipating, as I said before, the fourth industrial revolution. Now I can import from New York to the Technion some of the elements and install them in the Technion and in Cornell without much resistance because it proves successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have one question, uh, time for one question. And uh, this comes from uh, Mr. Haidt too. Uh, what about the impact with relation to Africa? I guess uh, Haidt too would be asking, uh, how can we build innovation uh, and promote innovation uh, in Africa? So, Sri, can I invite you to provide some comments? Yeah, we have a strong connection with uh... Africa universities. In fact, we are taking students from Africa. And also we have established uh, joining centers through the UNESCO program. In our university, we have UNESCO uh, a center for uh, higher education and new technology and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a, a constantly, we send our faculty to Africa. We also invite uh, the deans and presidents to come uh, to, to, to Shenzhen. I think it's important to we all uh, in the world work together, especially we should not forget that Africa is a part of our you know, global education system. So I, I think SUSTEC is committed 
to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shree. Uh, Levy, comments from you on how we can help. Uh, many suggestions for Africa. Well, during, during, the 19, during the previous century, during the 1960s, uh, there were uh, at least 100 African students studying in the Technion, uh, mostly agriculture engineering. It was known at that time that uh, many, many Africans come to the Technion. Uh, right now, uh, we do not have uh, many African students and we do not have many African relationship with African universities. Uh, the Technion had a great success in integrating the Arab minority into the Technion. We just recently published a paper in Nature about it. I truly believe that universities, uh, successful universities should adapt African universities should adapt African universities with student exchange, with faculty exchange, with expertise in order to uh, um, encourage them to uh, develop this ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, this is something that should be done. I agree with uh, uh, Professor Shi. This is something that uh, uh, well-established and successful universities should do for the sake of humanity. Thank you very much, uh, Levy. And I wish just to add, perhaps uh, just using uh, NUS example, uh, NUS, I think, uh, was only a teaching university 25 years back. Uh, we started research only about 25 years ago. Uh, and uh, in the past, I think uh, we have been sending our students to do their PhDs overseas, right, to top universities overseas. Uh, but uh, we invite them to come back and serve the university. And uh, that's how we actually build expertise. So it takes a while. Uh, Shri's example of Sustec is yes. probably uh, uh, an outlier. <laughs> uh, it takes more than 10 years to grow a very good university. Uh, I'm amazed how Shri, uh, you did it with Sustec. Uh, but uh, given time, uh, it is possible, but uh, you need to have your uh, students and your faculty members train in the best places overseas, come back and serve. And at the same time, what Levy has suggested was to get good universities to have more intimate partnerships so that they can actually uh, cross train and benefit sort of uh, through exchanges of students and faculty members. Uh, that would be a sure way of building. Uh, it takes time, right? And, uh, but uh, you are on a good track. So uh, we have come to the end of this uh, one and a half session. And uh, I'm really honored and thankful, I think, uh, to our two panelists, uh, Professor Levi Perez, uh, and also Professor Chen Shi. Uh, thank you very much, I think, for your wonderful sharing and for your wise words and wisdoms and advice. Uh, we will be sharing uh, their presentations uh, with uh, uh, attendees. And uh, last and not all, uh, I'd like to thank all our attendees uh, for staying through this one and a half session, hour session with us, uh, we have a third installment of Dialogue on Asian Universities uh, coming forth. And I do hope if you find that the last two sessions and including this one has been useful, uh, we hope that you can join us in the third uh, forthcoming session. Uh, once again, I think, uh, thank you very much. And since this is the new year, May I offer my warmest wishes to all of you and your loved ones uh, for a safe, uh, fulfilling 2021. Thank you very much, uh, Levi and Tashi and all of you. Good night. Good night. And a healthy one to all. Yes, safe and healthy.